All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have my little speech over here. Um, it's quite long, but I'll make it short. I would like to thank the Center for Advanced Study and the Center for African Studies uh, for making it possible for Zaki Ahmad to come here. And it is my pleasure to introduce Zaki Ahmad. Uh, his biography and achievements are quite long and very impressive. At the, as the leader of uh, South Africa's Treatment Action Campaign, TAC, an organization dedicated to complete and no cost treatment for HIV infected South Africans, uh, Zaki Ahmad has struggled to bring hope not only to South Africa, uh, but also to Africa in general, particularly Southern Africa, where the HIV AIDS epidemic uh, continues to take precious lives. He's a true human rights activist with roots in the anti-apartheid movement, uh, beginning from the Soweto riots of 1976 against, against the apartheid government to his current struggle in campaigning for the rights uh, to AIDS drugs and uh, medications in South Africa. His struggles have seen him challenge international pharmaceutical corporations such as Pfizer and MEC, who have the monopoly for HIV AIDS drugs. Companies who have also the backing of the most powerful nation on this earth, the United States and uh, its uh, European allies. He's also currently challenging the policies of the uh, Thabo Mbeki government in relation to provision and access to AIDS drugs, and slowly but surely succeeding uh, in the uh, battle. I personally find the following quote to be one of his most important statements. The rights to life and access to health care are non-negotiable. Profiteering at the expense of life, even when protected by law, is not a right. Among his numerous awards, he has received the Nelson Mandela Award for Health and Human Rights, was awarded an honorary master's degree in social science by the University of Cape Town. In 2002, was awarded the Homo Homini Prize by the organization People in Need. Uh, this prize is granted annually to an individual who has made a significant personal contribution to the protection of human rights and the promotion of democracy uh, through nonviolent means. Was voted one of the 35 heroes of 2003 by Time magazine. In 2003, he was awarded an honorary doctorate of laws from the University of Natar. In 2003, he received the Jonathan Mann Award for Health and Human Rights. President Nelson Mandela says the following of Zaki Ahmad. He is a role model, and his action is based on a fundamental principle which we all admire. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Zaki Ahmad, who will talk to us this afternoon about realizing human rights and access to HIV AIDS drugs in South Africa. Zaki Ahmad. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I hope you can hear me because I, um, yeah. I always get nervous after things like that, but I want to say thank you <laughs> uh, to Professor Calapeni. I think as we all gather here, um, the most difficult part of all our lives is that what lies ahead in the years coming, in religious intolerance, in xenophobia, in prejudice of all sorts, in discrimination, it's very, very important for all of us to rediscover our traditions. And our traditions, and by our, I mean those of us who are progressive, our traditions of anti-prejudice, 
a pro-feminist agenda, a pro-human rights agenda, a pro-freedom agenda, and above all, for those of us who fight inequality, a pro-working class and pro-poor agenda. When we look at where our tradition starts, it's not difficult to find places. But a place that I would like to visit is the struggle of the abolitionists, those who struggle to abolish slave trade. And there's a really brilliant book that I wish everyone would read and study and use by Adam Hochschild, which followed on his other good book, King Leopold's Ghost, called Bury the Chains. And it's, it, it's, it's his contribution on the English movement, the movement in England, to abolish slavery. And it speaks of a movement that brought together Quakers, people who refused to take their hats off to anyone, workers, students, women, society ladies, business people, members of parliament, and above all, former slaves. And he says about this group, the small group of people not only helped to end one of the worst injustices in one of the most in one of the worst injustices in the most powerful empire of its time. They also forged virtually every important tool used by citizens' movements today. I left out in democratic countries because we use the tools even in countries that are not democratic. So when I speak to you today about access to healthcare and access to AIDS drugs, that is the tradition that we in the Treatment Action Campaign base ourselves on. An internationalist tradition, a tradition that says people's lives are valuable wherever they are, whether they're in the poorest country or the richest country, whether they're from our country or not from our country, everywhere people's lives are important. So what was one of the greatest obstacles to accessing treatment and remains one of the greatest obstacles for healthcare access in poor countries, but also here in the United States where people have to cross the border to Canada to find access to medication, pensioners who cannot afford med medicines and so on. It remains for us the global pharmaceutical industry. I want to speak to you about some of the people in our campaign who made our struggle possible. And I want to use the examples of how they use both their bodies their voices, and above all their lives. They weren't victims. They stood up and were counted as citizens. One of the medicines used to treat HIV-related illnesses, one of the most common infections in people living with HIV, uh, is an illness called systemic thrush, or esophageal thrush. It's candidiasis, it's a fungal infection. Most of you will know it. It's what babies get, thrush on the mouth. Many women will know it as vaginal thrush. When you have HIV, the fungus comes up and it comes on your mouth and then goes down into your throat and into your esophagus. And there, of course, it stops you from swallowing, stops you from eating, you start losing weight, and you could die from it. And many people do die from it. The other common infection, which is related to that fungus, is, a, is an illness called cryptococcal meningitis. It's a fungal meningitis, obviously a disease of the brain. And the medicine used to treat that was a drug called fluconazole. It's still used to treat that. Uh, many of you will know it as Diflucan. It's made by Pfizer. It's just come off its patent. Now, in 1998, I had systemic thrush. And at that time, one capsule, 200 milligrams, and I needed about 30 of them, was, came to close on to $25 for a 200 milligram capsule, 25 US dollars. Now, one of the members of the Treatment Action Campaign, the late Christopher Maraca, on the 10th of May 2000, he went into our parliament, our democratic parliament, the place where many, many black people could never enter before. Now here for the first time was a black citizen of our country coming from one of the poorest townships in Yanga, an informal settlement outside Cape Town, coming to speak to our democratic parliament and asking it to do something. And he said to them, it is critical 
that you act to utilize compulsory licenses against Pfizer was profiteering from people's lives. And on that day, on the 10th of May 2000, Christopher was one of a number of people living with HIV who addressed our parliament. And so using parliament was critical in getting access to medicines for people. But above all, use Christopher using his voice, despite the fact that the funguses were not simply on his throat and by that time also on his brain, but also on the outside covering his whole body. Christopher died in July 2000. And in October 2000, the Treatment Action Campaign launched a, launched a, a campaign called the Christopher Maraca Defiance Campaign. And there we based our struggle on the defiance campaign of the ANC in the 1950s. We said, we prepared to take the consequences of our actions against unjust trade laws. And remember I said the, the medicine cost 25 US dollars for a 200 milligram capsule. In Thailand, we found a bioequivalent, World Health Organization approved, Medicine Sans Frontier, Doctors Without Borders used equivalent of the drug for 30 US cents. And our government had not been able to provide to people in South Africa, both nationals and non-nationals, had not been able to provide to them access to that drug because of drug company profiteering. And we brought this drug into South Africa in Christopher's memory. And yet, well, government tried to act against the treatment action campaign, but it, it became impossible because there was a ground swell of opposition within society saying this is unjust profiteering. And everyone from business people to judges even, not Judge Cameron, but other judges said, we will, we will go to Thailand and bring these medicines in ourselves. Now that was Christopher. Christopher died. He died of cryptococcal meningitis. My cousin Farida also died, but she at least had access to the fluconazole with which we had imported from Thailand. She lived an extra six months, which allowed her to make peace with the fact that she had HIV and allowed her to speak to a traditional Muslim family about her HIV condition and get the family to accept her as a human being. And that is what it did. But many people, like Christopher, continued to die because they did not have access to antiretroviral medication. Christopher's partner, Nunsikilelo Swedala, is a woman in her 30s, late 30s now. They have one child who, at that time, was 12 years old. Nunsikilelo was too sick to go to Parliament on that day of the 10th of May. And what had happened to her is, uh, many of you will know that when you have HIV, your CD4 count, a measure of your immune system, which is ordinarily between 800 and 1200 CD4 cells, her CD4 count had declined to 14. The viral load, which, which is a measure of the amount of virus in your blood, had gone from over 50,000 to 2 million copies per teaspoon of blood. She was desperately sick. She couldn't go with Christopher to our parliament. She was lucky. She was extremely lucky because what happened to her is she was able to access a clinical trial. And that is how she got access to antiretrovirals. In many poor countries, the only way that poor people can access, and not only poor people, but people who cannot afford expensive medications, whether for cancer, for heart disease, for arthritis, for a range of illnesses, often the only way that people get access to clinical trials. Today, Nunsikilelo is alive. She had marginal side effects from the virapine on her liver, and once it had settled down, it was dealt with, she, she's much better. She also had a further side effect called lipodystrophy, which is a redistribution of fat in her body, uh, which very often, with one drug called stavudine, is what many 
black women, particularly women with, uh, uh, I, must, I must make sure that I don't get it right, uh, wrong, women whose body weight is who are above a certain body weight, i.e. If, you, if, you, if you're obese, you will get uh, lipodystrophy or you will get uh, lactic acidosis or you will get um, one of the other side effects. But despite the side effects, Nonsikilero is capable now to look after her children. But she only survived, and she stood outside our Medicines Control Council, she stood up when 39 drug companies took the South African government to court. She gave an affidavit of why it is essential to have cheap medicines, generic medicines, not cheap in the sense of bad medicines, but affordable medicines for all people. Her body, her voice, her citizenship was used in affirming her citizenship as a black woman in our country, someone who couldn't have done it before, to demand the rights not only for herself, not only for other poor people like herself, but for all people in South Africa. Again, that wasn't enough. We had then to, to deal with two of the most powerful drug companies, GlaxoSmithKline, who was one of the manufacturers of some of the best, or, and, and in some cases, some of the worst drugs. Uh, GlaxoSmithKline, particularly for AZT and for Lamivudine, another German company called Beringer Ingelheim on Nevirapine. And what we did there is, again, one of the other tools we utilized is our competition law. Because very often, people say, utilize compulsory licenses, uh, which is part of the patent law and intellectual property law. But our competition commission in South Africa allows our government to investigate when people charge excessive prices for any product, excessive pricing to the detriment of the consumer. And of course, what happened is Nonsikinello, Hazel Tao, the Treatment Action Campaign, the trade unions, all of us went to the Competition Commission and we pointed out that the medicines that I take today, the medicines that keep me alive today, cost at that time, before the Treatment Action Campaign started our campaign, it cost about 1,500 US dollars a month to treat someone. Within a year, it had gone down to 450 US dollars per month. But that is way outside of the range of any person in South Africa. Most people in South Africa, there are very, very few people who could afford that. And yet, what had happened is GlaxoSmithKline went to one of our local generic manufacturers and said to them, well, we're going to give you the right to manufacture this drug locally. And they said to them, but you can only manufacture it for South Africa and only for the public sector in South Africa, not for the private sector. And then they went on to say, and you're not allowed to export it. And above all, they said to them, we want a 30% royalty on all your sales. And then, as a SOP to AIDS activists, they said that 30% royalty we will give to a charity of our choice. It's very charitable of them. <laughs> so when we went to the Competition Commission, we pointed out that th the degree of profit they made, because a generic equivalent of that same medicine, instead of 450 US dollars per month, was less than 15 to 20 US dollars a month. That's what we could get it at. Eventually, the Competition Commission ruled in our favor, and what we have today is I pay the approximate, in the private sector through private healthcare insurance, 45 US dollars for my medicines. And the state, in order to provide to anyone in South Africa, gets it at 20 US dollars per month. What happened to the generic company, Aspen Pharmacare? They managed to get a deal which says they can manufacture for the public and the private sector in South Africa. The royalty charged on it is no more than 5%. And above all, they are allowed to export anywhere in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And that is very, very important for us because many countries do not have the capacity to manufacture their own generic medicines and it would be wrong for South Africa to have access, but not our neighbors. 
And that's critical because many of you will know that South Africa is in an imperialist relationship with our neighbors, that we draw from Malawi, from Botswana, from Zimbabwe, from Lesotho and Swaziland labor. We send our products to those countries. We export our companies to those countries. Nigerians will know that today their biggest cell phone company is the South African one. But we do not accept any responsibility in a, a, a real way for our continent and its development. And so it's critical for those of us who are activists to see and to break down where we can the imperialist relationship between our country and other countries. Now, that, that's the question of the drug companies. The drug companies, when we started our campaign, we assumed would be the most difficult part of our campaign. But thanks to ordinary citizens here in the States, organizations like Medicine Sans Frontieres, individuals in Chile, individuals in uh, Kenya, individuals, organizations here in the States like Consumer Project on Technology, thanks to organizations such as those and individual citizens here, we managed to, for the first time, hold corporate interests accountable and bring the prices of medicines down throughout the developing world. What we have to do now, of course, is to ensure that it happens everywhere in the world, not only, and, and, and not only for HIV medicines, but for all medicines. But that's a separate issue, and we, I hope someone's going to ask me some questions about that. It would be unfair to put most of the blame on the drug companies. As all of, all of you will know, South Africa suffers from the strangest and weirdest and most inexplicable form of AIDS denialism through the form of our president, who regrettably, and I, I'm very proud to be a, no, no, I'm not proud to be a South African, I'm proud to live in South Africa. Uh, I hate nationalism of any sort. But essentially, anyone who lives in South Africa today will know that it is one of the best places to live in compared to what it was 10, 15, 20 years ago, compared to the times when 17 million people in the last century, in the 20th century, 17 million African men, women, and children went to jail under the pass laws because they did not have the right to freedom of movement in South Africa. Our country has changed immeasurably for the better. But despite that, there is a holocaust against poor people. And that holocaust is inspired by state-sponsored HIV denialism. State-sponsored HIV denialism. On Friday this week, last week, on the way here, this is what a high court had to say about our government. The decision by the Minister of Health, the National Department of Health, and the government amounted to a conscious, deliberate, and informed policy to sacrifice the life of babies that would contract HIV AIDS because their mothers were not treated with AZT in order to save the expense that, that would, have been, would have had to be incurred. On the 11th of September 2001, my colleague Sipo Mtati, who is the General Secretary of the Treatment Action Campaign, and he's a brilliant woman, and I, the two of us went in to meet with Archbishop Njongonkulu Ndungani. And while we were there, we received two phone calls. We went to ask him, we went there to ask him to visit a young child, five years old, who had seen Treatment Action Campaign members wear these teachers these t-shirts on, on television and had asked her aunt who was looking after because her mother had passed away, asked her aunt, what is that when she saw her aunt's interest? And her aunt said, those are people with HIV. And she turned to them and she said, will you invite them to come to my fifth birthday party? And TAC helped organize her fifth birthday party. But on the 11th of September, while we were with the archbishop, we got two, there were two phone calls. He got one and we got one. The one we got said she had died. The second one he got spoke of the death, the needless death, the terrorism that affected at least 3,000 lives directly here in the United States. On that day, 8,000 people throughout Africa, Asia, and Latin America died of AIDS-related illnesses, and not one of them have a memorial in the way that I speak of Sibongile Mazeka today. It is not to say, and that is in no way undermines the tragedy of 
September 11, 2001, and shouldn't stop any of us from speaking out against any form of terror and any form of violence against another human being anywhere. But all lives should be equal. And what justice is there for the 8,000 people who died? Now, the reason I mention Sibongile is because her aunt gave an affidavit in a court case that we had to take to our constitutional court to force our government to make available antiretroviral medication for pregnant women. And there were three reasons we did that. First and foremost, every woman who decides to give birth to a child has a right to give birth to a healthy child. So it is a reproductive right if she chooses to have a baby to have a healthy child. And so it is our duty to ensure that every woman has access to not only antiretroviral medication, but to proper antenatal care. And that was the first reason that we took it there. But then, of course, every child that is born has the right to be born disease-free. And so that child's right to life and right to healthcare access is critical. And here I'm not talking about stem cells and fetuses and stuff like that. I'm talking about once a woman has decided to have a child, the right of that child to live. And so that was the second reason. The third reason was we wanted, because what had happened at that point is that wealthy women, black or white, could access antiretrovirals to look after their children. And the only women whose children were getting HIV were poor women, as it still is today in our country. And it was critical for us to ensure that our government acted in the interest of poor women. We asked our courts to devise a program to ensure that our government rolls out antiretroviral therapy to, at, the, at that time, the government only wanted 18 sites. There are 3,000 healthcare facilities in our country, and the government only wanted to limit it to 18 sites across the country. Today, 1,500 women have, 1,500 facilities provide. It's not enough. We still have a huge battle ahead to ensure that our government does it. But if it wasn't for children like, who are aware of their illness, like Sibongile and our aunt, Constance Mashnangu, if it wasn't for women like them and men like Christopher, we would not have been able to get a judgment which said that our government's policy was unreasonable, unjustifiable, and unconstitutional. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have been able to get treatment for everyone. So we had to go to the courts to reverse state denial on a prevention of HIV issue. That wasn't treatment. That was basically prevention. But what about government treating people? As I mentioned to you early, earlier, all of us believe that South Africa's government today, despite all the difficulties we have, is a legitimate government. It is a good government in many ways. The policies we have are tremendous. The number of women in our parliament, the number of women in our councils, in many, many ways, the policies on housing, on education, on healthcare, they are good policies. But regrettably, the will to change things because of inheriting a bureaucracy that is difficult and also because of a range of international economic and social pressures, our government has not acted always in the interests of poor and working class people and above all of poor women. Now, what happened is that by 1999, and that judgment I quoted where the judge said it was expense that stopped the government from giving women antiretrovirals to prevent mother-to-child transmission, is slightly wrong because it wasn't expense. And one can't blame the court because this issue was not before the court. But fundamentally, it's the denial of our president. And our president was inspired by white HIV denialists from the United States, like Peter Duisberg, David Rasnick, Charles Geschechter, and so on. He couldn't find one decent African doctor who was prepared to say to him, HIV does not cause AIDS. Eventually, there was one doctor, Sam Mishlongo, who treated ANC members in exile, but who had written prior to his conversion, had written about the importance of using antiretrovirals. Our president, does not have the courage to say publicly that he doesn't believe that HIV causes AIDS. He questions it. 
His latest question was on uh, four, four weeks ago when he said, there's no evidence that people in our civil service are dying. Now let me speak to you of death and illness in our country and why it is important for us to continue our struggle for treatment. Our country has at least 900 AIDS-related deaths every day in our, today in South Africa. And I'll come to how we get to that figure in a minute. We have at least 1,500 new infections every day. And for us, the crisis of treatment is only eclipsed by the crisis in prevention. Because every person who gets infected now, their life is shortened. The pain that it would cause to them and their family can't be measured. The economic impact on their household, their community, and later on the healthcare service to treat a lifelong chronic infection, if they get treatment, is a major one. So for all of us, it is critical to understand that prevention is a greater crisis in many ways than treatment. But you cannot look at the one without looking at the other. Let's look at what our government, South Africa has five and a half million to six and a half million people living with HIV. That is based on seroprevalence studies that have been conducted in antenatal clinics. That is clinics where women go over since 1990. Now that is not enough to base your analysis on. We also have, over the last few years, conducted two national community prevalence studies, which have shown that our population, our total population, we have at least between 11 and 12% of people who live with HIV. So one, more, than one, more than one in 10 people, all people, live with HIV. But among people aged 15 to 49, that comes to at least one in every four people. Now, our president continues to, to question this. In 2001, he sent a letter to our health minister saying, I want you to, I see you're spending a lot of money on AIDS. This letter is released to Business Day. You can find it on our website. You can find it in Business Day. I really want you to look, because here's the list from the World Health Organization of causes of death. And it's clear to me that more people die because of violence, because of homicide, because of accidents, because of diabetes and hypertension. And of course, the list of deaths he was speaking about was a list of deaths for 1995, which Stats South Africa had provided to the WHO, but which didn't at that time include an AIDS epidemic. So of course he said there are no studies that show this. And because of his obduracy, Stats South Africa was forced to count 3 million death certificates between 1997 and 2002. To count 3 million death certificates. These aren't statistics. For every one of those 3 million death certificates, there's a grave, there's a family, there's an orphan, there's a mother without a child. Or a child without a mother, rather. Um, and critical for us is what the Stat South Africa death certificate report showed. It showed the following. It showed that in 1997, most adults died in their 60s and 70s. It showed that by 2001, most adults died when they were 30 to 34. And most critically, women died 25 to 29. It showed that natural causes of death had increased in real terms by 45%. It showed that unnatural causes of death, homicides and, and so on, had declined in absolute and in proportional numbers. It showed, most importantly, that the thing that should shame all of us, despite the fact that our government has ensured that every child gets vaccinated, which didn't happen under apartheid, that the number of people most affected by death are infants age one to five. So critically for us, here is evidence, not mathematical projections, but actual counts to show how people are dying. And yet, we had to embark on a course in 2003, we had to embark on a case of civil disobedience 
to ensure that our government makes treatment available to poor people. And we wouldn't have been able to get our government to roll out a treatment plan if it hadn't been for our activists like Edward Mabunda, who was an ANC member who died, and they, uh, they, they, I think it's still on our website. You could find, because he asked that we film him when he was dying in hospital. He participated in our civil disobedience. He was one of our poets. And critically, he was an ANC member who, when we went to bury him in the Winterfeld, which is Thabo Mbeki's old constituency, there was a fight between ANC Youth League members and TAC members over his body. And his family said he was both an ANC member and a TAC member. And it's critical for us that people remember that it was people like Edward that helped us get a treatment plan for our government to commit to roll out treatment for people. But it wouldn't have been possible without international support. And I just want to tell you an anecdote quickly. We called a day of action, I think it was the 28th of March, 2003, a day of international action. And at that time, it was 600 people a day who were dying of AIDS-related illnesses. And we said to people, what do you think we should do that is symbolic? And some smart activist, I think it was from the United States, said, why don't we take 600 pairs of shoes to the South African embassy and put it in front there? And we said, okay. And of course, what happened, the Americans got together a huge pile of shoes and they dwarfed the South African ambassador. The poor South African ambassador was a dwarf in front of this huge pile of shoes. The British were, in their usual sense, very, very sparse. They brought 30 pairs of shoes and they said, each pair of shoes counts. The Italians were absolutely beautiful. In Milan, in their embassy, they laid out 600 pairs of shoes on a piazza, which was, I promise you, a work of art. Uh, in Japan, people took 600 cranes, which is their symbol for people having died. A range of people in India did different things. People in Kenya did different things. And so that put enormous pressure. And the reason our president listened was because business people throughout the world said to him, we cannot invest in your country until you deal with this epidemic seriously. And regrettably, that's the reason he gave in. And today, that is the reason why he is attempting to sabotage the treatment plan. It's the, it's the reason where, why our health minister who studied medicine in Leningrad, and in Leningrad you learn two things. You learn party loyalty and you learn vodka. <laughs> Those are the two things that you learn. And it's a, it's, a, it's a regrettable fact that today we have to battle against AIDS denialists. Uh, many of you will have heard there's a vitamin salesman who cures cancer, diabetes, HIV, and now bird flu with his vitamins. And our minister has got him and the denialist David Raznik to experiment. In Kailicha, they conducted an unauthorized clinical experiment on African men, women, and children. And more than 10 people have died, and we have documented it. And the government hasn't acted against it. Our Medicines Control Council hasn't acted against it. And so it's critical. I, I, I'm so frustrated. Every time one achieves something, or our organization achieves something, you roll back. But I want to end on a note of optimism. I don't know if that's possible, but I think, I don't, I don't know who said it, that pes pessimism one should leave for bad times, or for good times. Pessimism is, is something for good times. Pessim pessimism should be the norm in good times. So what is the difficulty now? There are enormous difficulties that lie ahead, not only in South Africa, but globally for HIV prevention and treatment. We have to ensure that women gain equality, economic independence. If women aren't economically independent, we cannot, that's why, because women are not economically independent, prevention efforts have failed. You can throw as many condoms, male and female, and even later microbicides, at the problem. But without economic independence, we will not succeed in proper HIV prevention. Without some degree of job creation or social security, it will not work. So it's critical that globally, we look at efforts that stimulates social security, that stimulates demand and job creation for poor and working class and vulnerable women. It's also critical 
that in every country in the world, whether it's the United States, whether it's Britain, in the United States it's black young men, in Britain it's white young men and Pakistani young men, who feel completely alienated and socially excluded, and some economically excluded, that we find ways of economically and socially including those young men. One of our best leaders was a young woman called Lona Mlofana, who was on treatment for HIV, and she lived openly with HIV. And she went, when we closed our uh, year's program in December 2003, she went to have a party at a local shabin, a local tavern. There she was accosted by three men who raped her. They found out she had HIV, they murdered her. It's critical for us to say, why did we not reach those men? What is it that keeps them out of? What forces them to commit such heinous acts against women, against children, and also against themselves? So it's critical for us to engage in those things, not only in South Africa, but globally. I want to finish up in saying, today there are 110,000 people on treatment in South Africa in the public sector. They're mainly in the urban centers, they're mainly in the rich provinces, Western Cape and Gauteng, and a little bit in KwaZulu-Natal. But that wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for citizens like yourselves and citizens like ourselves, taking upon ourselves our global responsibility as citizens. I want to ask an appeal to, to all of you. In a month or two months' time, the United Nations General Assembly, I hope someone from the media is not here to pick this bit up because we'll be talking about it soon. The United Nations General Assembly will be meeting to discuss prog progress in HIV. And we want to ask all of you to follow those proceedings and those of you who can go to the demonstrations in New York, please to go. And those of you who can, please to carry a banner saying, President Mbeki, tell the truth about HIV. Because if we don't do that, all of us are culpable of a Holocaust against poor people in South Africa, in Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America. If we do not get it right in Africa, in South Africa, if we do not get it right in Brazil, if we do not get it right in China and India, if we do not get it right in Russia, the rest of the world will suffer. The poorer countries in particular will suffer. So it's an appeal to everyone to be part of those demonstrations. And we've just heard that the South African government has vetoed the participation of the Treatment Action Campaign, the AIDS Law Project, and the African, rights, uh, uh, the African AIDS and Rights Alliance of Southern Africa. So it's critical. We, we appeal to you to assist and to mobilize. I haven't spoken about George Bush. I hope someone's going to ask me some questions about uh, um, him and when we can expect uh, civilization to return if it ever has been here to the United States. So I want to say thank you very much. Um, while we just take a few minutes for people who may have other appointments to move on to those appointments, I do want to announce that um, we will have a reception immediately after this downstairs in the reading room on the first floor, so please join us for that. I know Zaki is willing to take a few questions. I think what we'll do is have people come to the mic here in the center, ask several questions, and then after he gathers two or three, he'll respond. So. Maybe just give them a few minutes. And, to... and, and the names, just say the okay. names. Yeah, and we'd like you to, we'd like you to announce your name. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Hello. I'm Jessica Horn. Uh, it was great to hear you speak. Nice to have lunch with you today, Zaki. So thank you so much for coming. Um, you've talked a little bit about sort of the economics of uh, antiretroviral drugs uh, and providing those to people. And there have been a lot of studies um, done in the past couple years about how it's actually cheaper for the South African government who provides free health care if they would provide uh, you know, antiretroviral drugs and mother-to-child um, drugs um, 
to, to everyone who is suffering from HIV AIDS in South Africa because it would limit the amount of hospitalization uh, with some of the other um, illnesses that, that are connected, like you spoke about, to HIV AIDS. So maybe you can talk a little bit about why the government of South Africa has not been responsive to a lot of these studies that are saying that it's actually cheaper to you know, provide these drugs instead of um, caring for pneumonia or caring for TB or caring for meningitis and some of these other things. So. Hi, uh, thank you so much for bringing the struggle to us um, with the passion that's going on in South Africa. But I mean, I've been trying to follow this issue in terms of how the South African state has dealt with this whole question of HIV, in particular Mabeke's resistance for years, right, to acknowledge the impact and the reality of HIV in South Africa and throughout Southern Africa. Um, and I just am still not clear on what the rationale is and what the potential motivation might be behind him and other people and within the government in terms of denying the realities of this pandemic and the way in which it's reaping absolute havoc in Southern Africa. And I just want, if you have a moment, to kind of enlighten me and other people on exactly what are the political stakes involved here on the part of the state in resisting and denying the impacts of HIV. Okay. Your name? Oh, my name is Mark Perry. All right. Hi, my name is Chika. I just want you to comment on the following. Um, there is a view that the reason why South African government does not or was unwilling to roll out antiretroviral drugs to stop mother-to-child transmission was that it did not want to be faced with the burden of caring for orphans. You know, once their mothers have died, so the best is to, you know, uh, keep away from that. Secondly, um, will you comment on your um, decision some few years ago to stop taking your treatment. And lastly, all the cases which you have quoted involved, you know, uh, um, examples of black people. And there could be a perception that it's only black people who are suffering from HIV and AIDS. Can you comment on that as well? I'll start with the last questions first. Um, I think it's critical to remember that when the treatment action campaign, and, and you're absolutely right, I quoted back as um, I was just looking at my notes, I was going to end on two uh, particularly uh, appointment cases. <clears throat> the epidemic affects everyone in the country, but disproportionately affected are poor people and disproportionately affected are black people disproportionately affected our gay people. In the early days of the epidemic, the projection of the epidemic was particularly among, uh, through the state among white gay men. Unfortunately, today the, the state does not even acknowledge that gay people, black and white, are at risk. So that's a huge problem. I'll give you an example. Last year in May, one of my closest friends a professor at Natal University, Ronald Lowe, uh, went on sabbatical in January. He then went to look after his mum who had developed cancer. And in May, almost exactly a year ago, I got a phone call on the 10th of May. And he said, no, it was around about the 10th of May, my mum had just died and I've just been diagnosed with AIDS. He had a CD4 count of eight. He had an enormous viral load and he died on June, 16, June, June 18th. Here was a white professor in whose house I spent three months a year, who had helped set up a committee to find uh, the murderers of Gugu Dlamini, a woman who had declared her HIV status and was stoned to death. And yet he didn't perceive himself at risk of HIV infection. And the question is, that there's many personal denial stories, like the DJ Kabzela, uh, who in August 2003, I was too sick to get out of my bed to go and speak on the same platform as he was speaking at Wits University. And he was speaking about the value of garlic, beetroot. Our, our health minister has a recipe to cure AIDS, garlic, beetroot, ginger, lemon, olive oil. 
and he spoke about taking those medicines. And there's a very, very important book that anyone who's interested in post-apartheid South Africa, in youth and in masculinity, should read. It's, it's a biography of him called Kabzela by Liz McGregor. And he died a really horrible death because of that denial of going to take medicines and the fear of taking medicines. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to take the cost questions together on, on HIV costs, on HIV treatment costs, and the question on, 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 on orphans, because that was essentially a cost question for the government. Now, the first thing to say is that is from the government, and the, and the person who made the argument on behalf of government was the late Parks Mankashlana, who was dying of AIDS as he was making these comments, saying, our government cannot treat the, uh, give these women antiretroviral drugs because they would leave orphans behind. If they died, the orphans would be healthy. Now, the question for me is, has anyone ever questioned the orphans that were left after the Second World War? The fact that society had to take care of them, the millions of white and uh, white orphans in the main in Europe, no, that's a cost society takes upon itself, and it's a measure of any society's humanity. Particularly, African societies have always been remarkable in responding to orphan crises, and so that was a particularly callous and reactionary statement emanating from a government which fought for the dignity and equality of black people. And that is something I hope our government will still be held to account for, and the people who made those statements and who made those policies were still would be held to account for. In relation to the rationale for the, for, for the president's statement, it's very, very difficult. It's almost impossible to explain. Our president raised many, many questions. He said, isn't poverty the cause? But of course, if you look at Botswana, Botswana is the country with the highest GDP in Africa per person, and yet it has one of the highest HIV infection rates and HIV mortality rates. At the same time, the late Parks, Mankishlana, President Mandela's son, Chief Butelezi's son, myself, we are not poor people. We are not nutritionally deficient. We don't suffer from nutritional deficiencies. Yes, there are people who have too little food, but that only makes the progression of HIV worse. It doesn't, it, it's not the viral infection itself. Food alone is not going to cure it. Food will help you a little bit, but it will not cure the infection and won't, won't take it away. What is the rationale? The only explanation that any of us can come up with is that it is a deeply based ideological position which has taken our president as you know, his formative years were spent in England. And the vision of Africa that he has is one of a renewed Africa, an African renaissance. AIDS undermines that project because his perception is very similar to bigoted white perceptions. And those bigoted white perceptions are that we in Africa are promiscuous, that we are diseased, that we carry poverty and that we beg. And he wants to get rid of that image. He doesn't believe that Africans are like that, but he wants to get rid of that image of Africa. And HIV concentrates that image, he thinks, of men who have too much sex. I often say to people, the Brazilians say we have lots of sex. They don't are afraid when people say to them they have a lot of sex. They're Catholic and they give out condoms. And on top of that, they've managed to reverse the epidemic. They're struggling now, but it's critical that we support them. But they haven't denied it because people say Brazilians have too much sex, say no, th therefore we don't do it. So I'm, I'm ra rambling like a banshee like I normally do. But <laughs> what, what I want to say is that the only explanation that we can give is that there's a deep fear that Africa is stigmatized as a racially inferior, sexually promiscuous, and begging. And the, the president wants to dispel that. Regrettably, that ideological and identity politics position undermines his very project of wanting to establish Africa as a strong independent force within world and local politics. And that brings me to the economic studies. It's a no-brainer. 
You know, the, I, I didn't speak about that, but the corporations in South Africa, Anglo-American, De Beers, Anglo-Var, all those people who established the migrant labor system in South Africa, which is one of the main drivers of the epidemic, who in the early days of the epidemic wanted to expel black people with HIV, black workers with HIV from their companies, now say it's cheaper for us to treat and prevent this disease than to continue ignoring it. Now, of course, someone should still ask them to explain why they haven't abolished the compounds, why there's still migrant labor, but which, which continues to fuel the epidemic. But the fact is, even they realize that it's cheaper to treat. I think since the colonial encounter, no South African, no state in Africa has been viable in any particular way to provide for the benefits of its citizens or subjects. So it's never been able to, and in fact, the only way it developed economically was through the exploitation and the brutalization of its, of its people. I think that's been a permanent feature of the colonial condition. So I think the latest Holocaust, and I think you're right to refer to as such, is perhaps not new. I mean, Holocausts have been a recurrent feature of, 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 the, of the livelihoods condition of African people, from the genocide in then German Southwest Africa to the current uh, genocide. So, and the continuing genocide in the Congo right, right now. So genocidal exploitation as a form of capital accumulation has been a central feature, and I think part of the explanation begins to lie in that notion of you know, the current South African government as, if you want to, the business managers of, of corporate capital, because they themselves are trying to set themselves, as you said, independently. So I think this idea of age denialism was maybe catchy. I don't think it's particularly useful in trying to get at the colonial origins of this crisis. Thank you. Any other question? This is a bit of a more of a personal question, but I was just wondering, you know, despite all the struggles and failures, what continues to motivate you and inspire you? I want to, I, it's, it's always good to have a debate. And uh, I think that the argument, I think it's Ken, right? Um, I think that Ken's argument uh, on AIDS denialism is wrong. Uh, you have to be in South Africa today to see how the Medicines Control Council, how the Medical Research Council, how the Human Rights Commission, how every institution of the state is being used to promote AIDS denialism, to genuinely promote AIDS denialism, and how the state is linking itself through groups, a range of groups, whether it's uh, uh, tr particular traditional healers, whether it is the Rath Foundation and so on, to attack organizations like TAC, above all to attack science, to attack medicine, to attack a range of things around the question of HIV denial. So the, I, I think it may be perhaps important, and, and this is the reason, the only organ, there's been only one newspaper article that has systematically drawn the links, and that was Fair Lady, not a newspaper, even a magazine, Fair Lady New Magazine that drew together all the articles there. And I think, you know, I think we cannot afford to speak of genocidal impulse against poor people without affirming the right to struggle. And so it's critical in, in, in and, and, and that's what I believe needs to motivate us. We cannot sit back in the pessimism and say, there's nothing that can be done because these things have occurred over many decades and over many millennia and over thousands of years. There's a lot that can be done. And for us, state-sponsored denial is a critical question. Yes, there are unviable states in Africa. And if you look at Lesotho and Swaziland in particular, the states have virtually collapsed for many reasons. But one of the fundamental reasons the Swaziland and Lesotho states have collapsed at the moment is because of HIV. A lot of the population of the civil servants, of the teachers, of the doctors have died. Lawyers, so on, whoever is required, police, 
and so on, required to keep the state alive, chiefs, headmen, all succumbing to the disease. And we in, I mean, we in South Africa benefit from Lesotho and Swaziland as migrant labor, but we do not, and they function like provinces, but they do not have the rights that provinces have of access to, to state resources and so on. So the difficulty is that all of us realize that, it, I mean, it's complex, and, and, and I think for the whole of the continent, uh, Malawi has a few hundred doctors left and a few thousand nurses left. Some of them have died, mostly push, pushed out of the state because of structural adjustment programs, uh, of which of course we don't take into account when we speak of the human resources crisis in HIV now. Um, but at the same time, this, for the first time there's an opportunity because states realize what collapse will bring and what the causes of it would be for human security generally, not only human security in Africa. And so I think we have the opportunity, and that is what encourages me, we have the opportunity to respond to this epidemic because there's a cross-class, cross-race, cross-national boundary interest, not in saving lives only, because unfortunately not many people are motivated by that in corporates and so on, but many of them are motivated by markets and market access and the fear of terror and of uh, uh, unviable states and, 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 and so on. So there are a whole number of things converging which makes it possible for us to assert an alliance to deal with the denial of our government, but also to assist Malawi, Ecuador, and a range of countries where states are almost unviable, to assist those states to overcome it and to deal with the epidemic in the interests of their citizens, but not without those citizens' voices being heard. Um, I think uh, it was Chief who asked me about my medicines and uh, taking my medicines. I never stopped taking antiretrovirals, I never started. Uh, I was meant to start my antiretrovirals and I didn't. Uh, I did so because it was for me a question of conscience. As, like my mum used to say, if I can't give all my children something, I won't give it to one. And it was very simple that I could, be, I could access it because I had friends who would put money together, but if my sisters or brothers had it, had HIV, they would not have the same friends who would put it together, and I think that's wrong. And one should not be able to purchase life. And today I'm back on my medicines, uh, and I've started taking my medicines in August, in, in, on the 5th of September 2003. It transformed my life completely. It gave me my energy back. Instead of being sick every week, I could concentrate on work. Above all, it gave me the opportunity to plan for a life ahead instead of planning for death. And that should not simply be my right, it should be everyone's right. I suffered some serious side effects from one of the drugs. I did a very stupid thing. I said to myself, Mantu and Tabo are going to laugh about this. They're going to say, see, you're getting the side effects. And instead of going to my doctor, I kept quiet. It was a very dumb thing to do because one should never let politics get in the way of science, whether it's Bush on human stem cells, whether it is uh, the human papilloma virus and the fact that he doesn't want young people to get vaccin vaccinated against uh, the human papillo papilloma virus because they'll get cervical cancer and that shows that they're promiscuous. Uh, I mean, it's stupid, 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 stupid. Uh, and then on the other side, supporting industry in relation to global warming, it's, it's critical that we understand that scientific denial serves the function of politicians, uh, both in the, interest, in the interests of industry, but it also serves their interests in the interest and in the convergence of backwardness, scientific backwardness, of uh, uh, religious prejudice and dogma. Ms. Merle Bowen, and I'm going to, I, I enjoyed your presentation. I have several questions, but I'll just ask you. can a ask few. all of them. Okay, <laughs> good, then we can have a chat. Um, the first question, I guess, is I want to open it to you in terms of um, American-U.S. policy. 
you said you wanted to talk about President Bush, and so I'm going to give you the opportunity. And um, maybe you can make it clear what the U.S. policy is, what President uh, Bush's policy is in terms of not only the drug companies, but his position on HIV AIDS. Um, and I want to make sure that I also understand this question about the pharmaceutical companies, WTO as well, because of course WTO has now intervened so that Brazil can stop, you know, it has not allowed anymore to produce these generic drugs. And so we have different strains and they can't respond to that. And so it becomes complicated because Brazil has, of course, this South-South relationship where it was supposed to be uh, building factories, especially in Southern Africa. So then does that mean that Brazil is building factories with drugs that are old, that are not going to be really useful to, to Africans? That's the, another question. And then I agree with you when you talk about the working class, the poor, but it seems to me that race is really a major issue. Race. Race. Um, I can't stop thinking of HIV AIDS and don't not think of people of color. Um, in this country, yeah. <laughs> we have a serious problem in this country and some of my colleagues probably, like Professor Assad, um, she, can, she can address that. But it's clear to me that in this country, we have a serious problem for black women. You look at the major cities, right? <laughs> it's black women who are dying. We're in denial in this country about who has HIV AIDS. It's not under control, right? So when you look in Brazil, it's the black people, right? So it seems to me that race is really important. And if we're going to try to control this or somehow or take hold of this, we gotta deal with the race question. And then that brings me to the whole question of the way you started your presentation because it was quite interesting when you're dealing with the anti-abolition movement. Let's think about the most successful social movements, right? Why did they work? Because on one hand, you begin with this, um, you know, uh, transnational <laughs> social movement that works. But then your examples, I'm trying to learn from your examples about what works, and you're talking about citizenship within a nation state. And I'm thinking that what's really going to work is a global social movement. And then why isn't that happening? And it's because of the way it's being presented. Why don't we have mobilization? It's telling us more than slavery ever did. So what's preventing this? When we look at you know, other movements that have been successful, why doesn't this galvanize? Why aren't we all really angry? Thank you. All right. I think uh, this is, it's, a, it's a really uh, great discussion because I think, I hope I didn't come across as discussing from only a nation state more. The examples I wanted to use were ones in which the poorest and most vulnerable citizens, whether it is Christopher and his partner in Sikilelo, were prepared to use their bodies and voices in association with organizations around the world and in association with local organizations to put pressure on drug companies, to put pressure on powerful in, in global factors. Uh, so the examples I used from a local perspective was to say that none of it would be possible if we'd acted alone. It was only because we acted in concert with international supporters. Both uh, ACT UP in Philadelphia um, uh, the European group of people living with HIV and so on. What you write about, and here it is something that we as black people, as people of color, have to address. The question of race and HIV. Because it seems that we are ashamed that we have a virus because it's associated with our race. And it is that stigma that very often provide, stops black intellectuals from addressing the question of HIV. There have been very few black intellectuals, both here and in Africa, who have addressed the question of HIV. Then, on top of that, because I think there's a fear of social stigma, and then on top of it, we have the taboos of sex, of death, of, of intergenerational sex, of sexuality and sexual orientation, which 
I mean, I'm an African fag, and I'm proud of it. And there are many people like me. And, you know, well, I, 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 I'm not proud of anything, so I should leave pride out of it. Pride is one of the seven deadly sins. Uh, but just to come back to the question, the, we don't discuss sexuality very often. And I think that those are the reasons why it's much more comfortable for Madeleine Albright to sit with, what's that senator who's now going to run, the right-wing senator, at the time Global Health Summit and talk about AIDS in poor countries, than it is for them to talk about AIDS in the US ghettos. It's much easier for Time magazine to run article, articles on AIDS in Africa than to talk about what's happening in the inner cities of Lon London, New York, uh, uh, Scotland, and so on and to address the question of what's happening to poor working class white people and black people within those cities. And so it's critical for us to understand that affirming our racial identity, or if someone thinks I'm dumb because I'm black, that, that's because they're dumb, not because I'm dumb. Uh, that's their stupidity. So we need, if someone thinks that I am promiscuous because I have HIV, that's because they don't have an understanding of the virus. That's their stupidity. Now, I know my discourse is very rational and is, based, is premised on rationality, and I make no apology for that. I really make no apology for that. I think there's been too much cultural relativism and, and navel-gazing around uh, the question of science, identity, and so on. But I really agree with you that as black people, we have a duty to, to look at why our communities are more affected and not to be ashamed of it and to say you are letting poor working class women, men, gay men, and above all also black people die. And we shouldn't be afraid of that. We shouldn't because again we're allowing something to happen because of our pride as black people. We don't want to be stigmatized and we should get away from that irrational pride uh, because it's, 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 it's inverting the image of, that white people have of us. It's inverting the image that irrationalists, or not white people, but I hate that term too, but anyway, I'm, I'm crazy. <laughs> um, George Bush, it's, you know, the, it's very, very important to recognize that we need enormous resources to fight this epidemic. We need to rebuild healthcare systems destroyed through underinvestment, through structural adjustment, through any number of things. In South Africa, our healthcare system, to give you an example, there's the private healthcare system, which used to be white, which is now non racial. It deals with about 7 million people. It spends exactly the same amount, or slightly more, than the state healthcare system, which deals with 38 million people. That inordinate division between rich and poor. And the poor are primarily, again, black. Now you have a different thing. Let me give you an, a different example. When Ken and I were children in South Africa, which is a decade ago, or many decades ago, <laughs> you know, when we used to f struggle for equal education, many comrades here will remember there used to be the South African Institute of Race Relations public their annual survey. And they used to publish and say, Every year, the government spends 1,000 Rand on every white child's education, 800 Rand on every Indian child's education, 300 Rand on every colored child's education, and 120 Rand on every African child's education. And that mobilized all of us to enormous heights to get rid of an unequal education system. Today, what do we have? Formally, the state spends the same amount of money on a Kailicha child as they spend on a Rondebosch child. And they'll prove it to you. They'll say, here's the money we give to the Rondebosch child. Here's the money we give to the Kailicha child. In our country, there was a study done recently, which the government hasn't released, on education. And it shows that in the former white schools and former Indian schools, what are known as Model C schools, 65 out of every 100 kids at the age of 12 can read, write, and count. In the old colored schools, it's one in 100 kids. In the old African schools, 
999 children cannot read, write, and count at the age of 12. Now, what does that say to us? Not that African children are more stupid, because if you look at the resources in Kailicha, the school fees that poor people pay are 150 rand a year, and most people cannot make those school fees, so their kids suffer. But in Rondebosch, the school fees are 6,000 rand a year. And so what you have is that in four, there's the formal equality of what the state spends, but middle-class people like ourselves cross-subsidize each other, and we leave the poor to die, to be uneducated, and so on. And it's critical that we, recre we recreate that moral consensus about public goods. Education is for everyone. Health is for everyone, and so on. And uh, I think that's what motivates me sometimes. I'm, I'm preaching instead of uh, answering. I think this conversation is just beginning, so I want to invite you once again to come downstairs to the reading room for uh, reception and give Zaki a break um, to replenish his voice and thank him for his visit. Thank you.